what is your story and what really sets you apart? As you're in an interview and you're trying to make a more competitive application and highlighting the things, what is the memorable thing about you? Who are you in that story? And I think part of that, as a DO applicant, that's part of our story. That was Dr. Isaac Kirstein, Dean at The Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine, Cleveland. On this episode of Making the Rounds, Dr. Kirstein shares his insights on applying to residency programs as a DO med student. Here's AMA senior news writer, Brendan Murphy. Hello, and welcome to Making the Rounds. I'm Brendan Murphy, senior news writer at the AMA. Today, I'm talking with Isaac Kirstein, DO, Dean at the Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine, Cleveland. Welcome, Dr. Kirstein. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me here. We are very excited to have you today. We are going to discuss the intricacies of applying to residency programs as an osteopathic student. We are a few years almost a half decade into this combined match now, and uh, it's gone pretty seamless. With the match rate between DO and MD seniors being essentially the same, is there a reason for DOs to approach the match any differently than their MD counterparts? Yeah, thanks for asking. We're really proud, actually, of how well we've done in the match, and it's gotten better and better each year. Uh, and we've each year has been a, a new record breaker for placing our students across the country. Uh, it, we do have to, when we counsel our students, we do have to let them know, though, that as good as the aggregate numbers are, and we keep saying the match rates are, are the same in both, there's still a lot of differences between the two, especially when we look at specific programs and specific specialties where there still is a difference. So a lot of our advice that we give is really has to be geared towards the students' goals uh, and, and what the, they're trying to achieve and where they're trying to achieve it. You yourself are an internist looking at the data. DOs gravitate toward the primary care specialties. In 2022, DOs filled about a quarter of the spots in emergency medicine and family medicine, for instance. Why is that? And do you see that trend continuing? I do see that trend continuing. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's part of our heritage. It's part of being, uh, you know, our osteopathic history. Uh, is rooted uh, in, in that primary care base of taking care of the whole patient. So, you know, our students who come to us who are interested in a holistic care tend to gravitate towards more of the holistic specialties, which is why primary care is so well subscribed. That being said, you can bring this philosophy to any specialty and our, and our graduates do. Uh, one of the things that really impacts why we still have such a high level of primary care placement is that our training nationally is done in, in community-based education centers. You know, uh, most of the osteopathic uh, programs are not in large academic health centers in big, you know, urban areas. We, we do community-based care uh, type training uh, all over the country. Uh, and actually have a lot of our programs also in underserved areas, both rural and urban. Uh, so the students who train in these places also gravitate towards taking care of these kinds of patients, these kind of communities, and we reinforce that desire and passion uh, to serve in primary care. Uh, and so we're happy to continue to have that track record for sure. Uh, at the Heritage College, we're also proud to say, look, if we put a psychiatrist in the middle of an urban area or an underserved area, we're meeting our mission as well. So we emphasize primary care uh, as a profession, but we also do a great job making sure that we can place uh, all specialties, especially for the communities that need them. So looking at all specialties and all settings, if you have a student come to you and they say, I want to practice maybe plastic surgery, you mentioned psychiatry at a large academic medical center. Mm -hmm. How do you counsel them to go about that process? There might not be as many DOs in those programs, certainly. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And it takes, you know, uh, it, it does take a specific counseling. And we should say that a lot of these specialties still have a, a large discrepancy, even when you realize that one out of four students are osteopathic, you know, we're not getting one out of four of them into plastic surgery. So there still is a bias and there still is a discrepancy, you know, a, a, an overall statistical difference between a lot of these surgical subspecialties. That being said, we are placing them uh, in these programs, albeit at a lower rate, we hope to get them higher. Uh, so they need to be very competitive and, and competitive in the same way that uh, uh, their uh, allopathic medical student colleagues are competitive to really focus, especially on research uh, in those areas uh, and to work uh, closely uh, with a lot of uh, academic programs that we can let them rotate through, through audition rotations uh, and research projects. Uh, and they really have to shine. Uh, so they uh, have to do very well on, on, on licensing exams, unfortunately. Uh, uh, it's still a, a required uh, metric uh, for the decision of getting into a residency. 
Uh, and um, uh, so that that is our that that is our recommendation for those specialties is that students really have to tell a story, uh, no matter what specialty you go into. But uh, to be competitive, they have to in those specialties they have to do what their MD colleagues are doing, and they have to do a little bit more of it if they don't come from a program uh, where that department is just three floors up. You mentioned that there is still a bias in some programs, some specialties. How might that manifest during the residency selection process? And how do you counsel students to navigate it? No, nah, it's a great question. So the way we do is we actually, we have a lot of data, um, uh, not program specific data, but on specialty levels, we have all of our students really review uh, the, the NRMP reports that come out every other year uh, about, uh, you know, all, all of the placement uh, data for each specialty. So they understand the kind of scores that were the average for all DOs and MDs who got into those programs and how many research projects they had and how many, uh, uh, you know, uh, how many interviews they took uh, and, and all of that stuff. Uh, so, but we also counsel them besides that big data set, we say, look, you got to talk to the program. If you audition there, you know, you can ask them directly, how many DO students have they taken uh, in the past, uh, have successfully matched? What are their views on it? One of the biggest areas of bias is on licensing exams. If they take the USMO, if they only uh, are going to accept or they mandate USMLE, even for the DO students, which many of them still do. Um, so, so that that's a that's an added burden uh, that the U.S. students have to do, and we counsel them absolutely uh, the, for those specialties. We wish they didn't have to take both, uh, but we still counsel them that, uh, especially if a program they want to get into is requiring it, obviously they they, they have to do it. Um, and 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 so. That's the biggest thing is what's their track record of taking DOs in the past. Uh, we really encourage students to look at programs that have osteopathic recognition already uh, and have a track record of taking uh, a lot of DO students. But every year uh, ongoing, we have more and more programs that are taking their first DO student or their second DO student. And those numbers, uh, we are really hopeful, will continue to grow uh, each year uh, as that process continues. Uh, I, I do take hats off to the to to uh, you know the NBOME and, and our, my, the ACOM Association of Osteopathic Medical Schools and ACGME. We're working with all the programs to show them that the Comlex is is just fine, and we're going to continue to work on that area. Uh, and, and we hope more and more of them uh, feel comfortable with with the, that licensing exam uh, as a decision point. So there's a lot to it. That's how we counsel the students. Uh, it, it is a, it's a changing landscape, uh, but one that still has some challenges for DO applicants. So is your opinion that if you, in certain specialties, let's say the surgical specialties, there was a recent research paper about DO matches in surgical specialties, and they certainly don't rival the primary care specialties. Um, if you're applying to those specialties, is it just a foregone conclusion that you're going to have to take complex level two and step two? Uh, it's not a foregone conclusion, but I, 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 at this moment in 2023, it's a likelihood. Uh, it, it's more likely than not. There are certainly uh, are surgical programs uh, that that will accept the complex and don't require it, but they're the minority, and, and so we need those, you know, to increase. I, I do want to kind of, you know, mention. And it's really it's we, we focus so much on the licensing exams, but everybody in this conversation, I think the students need to know this, too. You know, the purpose of a licensing exam is to gain a license. It's not a very good measure uh, of a student's ability to get into a residency. Unfortunately, the GME programs have so many applications that they need something to screen them down by. Uh, and 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 so it's it's a it's an inappropriate use of a great test uh, that's designed for another purpose. And I really always counsel all of our students. And it's really good advice for the MD applicants too. Uh, it's not a judge of how good of a resident you'll be at all. Uh, and so uh, it's important as you go into this process with eyes wide open, it's, it's a necessary step. I, I, I would love to actually point out, you know, as an example, this year, uh, DO applicants and MD applicants have to go through a different process if they're going to apply to, they did last year, apply to OB. There's a different application service now for OB. Um, and, and there's, uh, I have to hats off to uh, the AMA who is supporting uh, APCO and and, and uh, through the change GME grant, they're 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 ruffling some feathers. They're making some big changes, uh, and there's a lot of debate going on uh, about that. Uh, and what I can tell you for our students, it may be a bit of a hassle uh, to have to do another application service. I know they're trying to reduce the burden, but if it were 
the purpose of it is that the OB wants to take a more holistic look at all students, uh, including the DO applicants. Uh, and that's a positive thing for all of MD and DO applicants to take a holistic look at them. And that's what we encourage them to continue looking at doing. I don't have the actual data, but I heard from AFCO that in this last cycle, they actually interviewed more, a higher percentage of DO students. Uh, as they first started this, and they're just getting this process going, and and that 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 shows some progress. Now, the total percentage of and the and who matched in the rank was about the same, which shows there's still some bias. Uh, but um, my hope is that we continue in those directions. Now, I'm not saying that every specialty should get their own application service or anything like that. That's the worries. Um, but I really do hope that you know I think the students should know that these conversations are ongoing. Uh, with AMA and AOA and and all of the associates, you know, all, all of our big associations really do want the best. Uh, we want the, the right students to wind up at the right GME programs, and these conversations are ongoing. And that uh, OB application is going to take hold in full effect next year, I believe. Uh, so for our listeners now, that's one yeah. thing they don't have to concern themselves with, which I think right. is a relief for this cycle. Yes, no, no, thank you. I'm, uh, we're, we're, we are ahead of that for that for sure. But I, I, but I, but I think it's good for our listeners to understand that, um, boy, it's a moving target and it's evolving quickly. Uh, and these conversations are changing too. And I, and I, uh, I'm optimistic as a whole uh, for osteopathic applicants as well. Uh, I think the directionality we're looking at is very good. Absolutely, and that was uh, evidence in level one and step one moving to pass fail, which I think has been a, a relief to students. You talk about applications. What about application figures? Do you have a specific target you advise for? For the 2022 match, DOs submitted an average of 92 applications compared to 68 for MDs. That is going to vary so widely on specialty, though. Do you have a target number? Is it just highly individualized? How do you advise that part of the process? <laughs> um, both those numbers are ridiculously too high. Right. And, and no, nobody would agree with that more than the program directors themselves uh, and ACGB. And we're creating a, you know, uh, it, it's just created nationally an, an aggregate, uh, uh, just 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 a, <laughs> a traffic jam um, uh, for sure. Uh, I, I, I don't have a specific target to say what we do use. Uh, obviously, you mentioned it does vary by specialty. We do use the So the NRMP report does for students who DO students who successfully matched in each specialty, it tells it does give the data that we provide our students, and all our students can get it from their schools. Um, how what was the the average number of applications filed for each successful person? We use that as a target, um, but uh, so but we, we we definitely try to to um, make sure that uh, uh, they don't they don't feel a need or, or stress out to go way above that number. Um, the reality is, is that the, the system, they just can click whatever they want. You know, it, it is, it is a very low friction system to apply the difference between 60 or 90 applications is big in its impact, but for the applicant itself, it, it's kind of a no brainer. Um, so we do need to get the entire system to a better place. Uh, I wish I had a clear out advice to say, oh, just do 10, just do 20. Um, but we don't have the data to back that. So we really are just using uh, you know, the last match performance report we get from NRMP and saying this is a general guide uh, of what's been successful and what people who were successful before you, um, what they did. Uh, and uh, I, I hope we continue to evolve uh, in uh, this conversation a better place so our, so our students don't have to send so many applications. And that number has been on the rise for years, that application mm -hmm. total, but it was certainly the increase was accelerated by the move to virtual interviews. Um, it's just a reality, of, which is, I think most people would say very advantageous to students to have those virtual interviews, but this might be a, a small adverse byproduct of that. Yeah, it's multifactorial. Abs absolutely. Uh, and there's cost involved in, and, uh, and, and all the interviews, uh, even if they are virtual and there's a lot of conversations about hybridizing those. And, and the, you know, I, I do think overall for the students, it is much better. Um, and the program directors, for very good reasons, actually would like to see them face-to-face. -face, you know, wish they still had uh, some of the face-to-face -face as well. 
Um, but uh, that that's going to continue to to evolve as well, and and, and it is geographically specific and and uh, specialty specific, which is why it's so important. I know our residency advising team does such a great job, but it really is so case dependent, and and uh, we 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 really have to tailor our advice for each student um, in, in a unique way based on do they want what town they want to go to, what specialty, and their background. We've done about. 20 of these meet your match episodes and the the most universal advice is to work with your team at your school i mean that is not applicant dependent that that is just the obvious and most helpful tool at your disposal seems to be the consensus in speaking to a couple dozen people about it well i couldn't agree more so uh we you know i always joke with my students too that pretty much you know Deans have a very vested interest in the match. Uh, I love my job, but I want to keep it. Uh, and uh, <laughs> right, and so uh, uh, it's a, a tongue-in-cheek joke. Also, that the, the last person who a program director wants to hear from is the dean, because uh, we're only going to talk about how wonderful uh, each and every applicant uh, our students are um, and uh, are supported. But 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 knowing that, yeah, absolutely. It, the, from the senior leadership on down, we're very vested in admissions and match. Uh, the input and the output, uh, major inputs and outputs of, of medical school. Uh, and so uh, at my school and most schools, we've invested in really good people who uh, uh, have set up systems uh, of advising. Uh, and, and we have a gem of a team here at our school, uh, and they have great experience. And, and the other real strength they have, uh, and, and this is both, and for the DO applicants, I can tell you this firsthand, all of the residency advising directors uh, at all of the osteopathic medical schools get together on a on a call uh, on a zoom call uh, monthly uh, and, and compare best practices uh, and, and are sharing best practices for advising uh, uh, just so that they can give the very best advice and so information is disseminated and and the MD applicants who may be listening there's this double MC has a very similar structure as well uh, and, and so yeah I, I can't underscore it enough. Um, you know, listen to the advice. Um, I think that uh, uh, the the challenge we always have, I, I'll be very frank too, the challenge we have are for students who are, are their aspirations may be a little bit higher than their applications will allow. Uh, and so we sometimes also listening to your school and listening to stuff, sometimes there's some tough conversations also. Uh, I can speak from personal advice. I tell all my students to achieve, you know, to shoot for their dreams. Um, but if I give them a very, we use the NRMP data, I say, this is your chances, your odds are low that you're going to be a orthopedic surgeon or a plastic surgeon. I'm not saying it won't happen, uh, but it, you know, based on all this data, this is the reality. Uh, and I counsel them very strongly then to look at a plan B. Um, and, uh, uh, and so I think that's really strong advice. And I think based on their and I, and I know that many applicants at all of our schools are going through those kind of conversations. So if somebody is listening and you get that conversation, um, I, I hope that that you could have a very honest discourse and conversation with your advisor as well. These are few and far between. I think most people do shoot for the right, you know, they, they find their space and they find their uh, their right level of, of, of competition. But uh, for these tough conversations uh, that we have, it's important that you can be in a place to receive them and be as productive as possible and not take it all as a personal judgment on yourself. And I'll throw a little bit of a plug in here. If you're listening to this on one of the many podcast uh, mediums, you can scroll down in the feed about three episodes and we have an episode on realistic applying. So if you oh, want great. more information on <laughs> how to understand your standing, listen to that episode. And I advise you to listen to all our episodes. We were talking about how individualized things are, and I do hate to ask these broad questions, but we're a few weeks away from the deadline for programs to begin accessing applications. And then after that, interview invitations will go out. Do you advise students to accept every interview invitation? The convention is usually you want to be in double digits to feel good about your chances of matching what do you advise DO students about that part of the process? Right. So this is a pretty generalizable piece of advice, I think. Um, and, and that is we really encourage early in the process to, to take them uh, as they come in early in the process. Uh, and then where it starts to, to individualize is if you're, and, and if you're a rank list starts, if you feel like you're starting to get enough uh, uh, interviews 
so that you could build a good rank list. We then start telling ask, telling students to consider to not accept every interview. Um, and uh, we also have that data. How many, what was the you know, average number of interviews successful applicants receive um, uh, for a given specialty? Um, and we use that as a guide. As it gets later in the process, that's when we tell them to tailor back uh, uh, on the numbers. And, and the one big thing I say too, as a caveat, is, um, uh, is absolutely attend every interview you accept. Uh, and if you would like to cancel an interview, do it with a lot of time, uh, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of prep time so that it's not last minute cancellations. Um, that, that actually does not reflect well on you. Uh, and I am very honest with our students, it reflects poorly on the overall program. When, if we have one or two students who can be our no-show, deans sometimes get a, a little email uh, from that program director um, because it's unprofessional and they, and they want to let us know. So uh, that's another bit of counseling we always do with interviews as well, is that uh, to be professional about it. And it's okay to cancel an interview, but do it with plenty of notice. And I should say the average uh, number of interviews for matched applicants in 2021, and it was fairly similar in 2022, was 14. So you're looking mm -hmm. at around 10, 12, you're feeling pretty safe. You took care of the nation. It's time for the nation to take care of you. The AMA stood by America's physicians and patients during the pandemic, and we're not stopping there. We're fixing prior authorization, leading the charge on Medicare payment reform, supporting telehealth, fighting scope creep, and reducing physician burnout. It's time to rebuild, and the AMA is ready. To learn more about the AMA Recovery Plan for America's Physicians, go to ama-assn.org slash time to rebuild. There. As far as the actual interview, we talked about biases against DOs or things they might have to confront relative to bias. What about some of the unique aspects of training as a DO and how should you highlight that in your interview? I think I, I think very positively uh, they should highlight their what what they value about their training. That's kind of generalizable advice to to MD applicants as well as DO applicants. Um, what is your story? Uh, and uh, and what you know really sets you apart. As you're in an interview uh, and, and you're trying to make a more competitive application uh, and, and highlighting the things, uh, what is the memorable thing about you? Who are you uh, in that story? And I think part of that, as a DO applicant, that's part of our story. Um, and I think that you you know be be authentic. What I really appreciate about the DO training was, and for some people, it's having this added skill of osteopathic manipulative technique. It's having the added uh, palpatory experience uh, and, uh, and being able to do a, a more thorough physical exam because you got 100 hours more training uh, in this area um, and, and, and you value it. Um, and, uh, and then also just uh, you know, the, the philosophy uh, and understanding uh, that uh, really we're trying to guide people back to health. It's not about curing disease and that, you know, go back to the basic core tenets of what it is to be a DO. Be proud and confident in, in your DO training and, and that you are a DO uh, for sure. And the one advice I get is don't ever make an excuse. Don't, don't ever say, yeah, I got, I got, you know, or try to say I'm, I'm equal. I got all the good training. It is who you are and be proud of it. Um, and uh, I think people are proud of, uh, osteopathic physicians who are proud of their heritage. We spend a lot of time talking about what to do. Is there something you would advise or caution against what not to do, what mistakes to avoid as a DO applicant? I think uh, there's a couple of things. I think over-interviewing and over-applying is, is a mistake that I think uh, is universal uh, as well, uh, and, and to caution uh, against uh, that for sure. Um, it's not as strong as a not to do, but it's but it's 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 just not effective. I think a lot of a lot of students' applications, a lot a lot of the applications are are, are wide, what I call wide and shallow. Uh, they 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 I need research experience, so they work on seven different kind of quick research papers, and they get maybe an authorship, maybe maybe they got four posters, or or they got to do one presentation, but there are different projects everywhere. And I did eight of these different service projects, and then I did two, you know, and and. The fact is, it's not your story. It's just like, okay, you're just trying to very much build your CV. You want a story that that shows what you're passionate about. 
Um, and so I really, as, as students are trying to build their CV, when it comes to research, find research that's passionate for you and go deeper. Find uh, uh, social uh, causes, uh, public service, uh, community service, things that, that um, are, are true to who you are and, and, and go deep on those. Um, so I really caution, I see this pretty frequently with, with these students who just have what I call CV filler. And uh, I want the authentic application. Um, I also have to you know, remind my students too, before I became a dean, I, I, I was uh, an, an internship program director at a DME DIO. Uh, I was on the other side before I came here. So, I, you know, that's, that's what they want. They want to know who you are. Um, so, so that's, that's the, uh, the, the do not do is don't set up an application and an interview um, that, that is just a broad display of activity um, without really getting to the truth of, of who you uh, are. Um, I, I think that, that that's a key area. Um, and, and the, you know, the other don't do's is, uh, you know, and this, this is luckily is very rare, but, but I tell students don't, don't rank a place you really don't want to go to. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the end, I'm just going to throw a couple at the end just in case, but I really didn't want to move to this town. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm come from a rural background and everything else. I applied to all of these different kind of small towns and mid-sized towns. And all of a sudden I got you know, uh, uh, this one position in this this inner city urban area in a program that's my third specialty choice. You know, if you match, you gotta go. Um, so I tell folks uh, all the time, uh, really make sure that you have a good connection uh, to the programs and that you're confident that you can go to any of them on your rank list and would be happy uh, to go to any of them on your rank list. Do you have any other advice or insights you'd like to offer our listeners? Um, you know, I think the theme that I always have is, is that, um, is for us, for the DO applicants, there are, uh, we're good at it. We're good at matching. We're good at getting into programs. Uh, and, and our, 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 ma our, our, you know, our match placements are, are very strong, uh, that, uh, and to be confident in that and be confident in who you are, uh, and, uh, you know, really know your story. Uh, as you set up your audition rotations, know that you are telling your story, um, and uh, every day is is that. So we also, you know, be the first first on rotation, be the last to leave, make sure the residents love you, do all the reading. Uh, that you know, everybody's doing that. Um, be be yourself. Don't be who you think they want you to be. Um, be yourself. Be be who you, why you're there, why you're interested in their program, and rank them the same way in your application the same way. Um, I, I found that um, authentic, my authentic, true student, you know, my students who truly understand their north star, um, match very well and have very meaningful careers. It's great. It's a great job, and uh, I wish everybody the best of luck uh, on this journey. It's very stressful, but there's also a big party at the end, and we love having our celebrating with all of our so, so successfully matched students, soon to be graduates. That's uh, good to remember that uh, come St. Patrick's Day, you'll have many reasons to celebrate. I know for many students that probably feels like an eternity from now, but it does come every year. I, I, well, I haven't missed. Uh, we haven't missed one yet, uh, which is great. Well, we appreciate you taking the time for being with us today, Dr. Kirstein. I, this has been so valuable for our listeners. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for all the great work you guys are doing at the AMA. I am AMA senior news writer, Brandon Murphy. Thanks for listening to Making the Rounds. Don't miss an episode of this Meet Your Match series. Subscribe to Making the Rounds on your favorite podcast platform or visit ama-assn.org slash podcasts. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.